Ladies and gentlemen, online viewers worldwide, welcome to the 2020 Tang Prize Laureate Lecture in Biopharmaceutical Science. 2020 was a year marked by unprecedented challenges brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. While the pandemic has put most things on hold, our endeavors in gathering the Tang Prize Laureates in Biopharmaceutical Science to highlight the importance of groundbreaking research and innovation in biopharmaceutical science have not been reduced. Now, please join me to welcome Dr. Zhang Wenchang, Chair of the Tang Prize Selection Committee for Biopharmaceutical Science, to introduce the 2020 Tang Prize Laureate. Dr. Zhang, please. It's my great honor to introduce the three laureates of the 2020 Tom Prize in Biopharmaceutical Science to you for the contribution to the development of cytokine targeting biological therapies for the treatment of inflammatory diseases. Dr. Charles Dina Reynolds, Mark Federman, and Tatamizu Kishimoto. The first laureate is Dr. Charles Dina Reynolds. Dr. Dina Reynolds received his medical degree at Yale University, and now he is a professor of medicine at the University of Colorado. He identified and cloned IL-1 beta and verified IL-1 beta as a potent immediate protein to explain fever and inflammatory diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis. His discovery led to the development of therapeutics, IL-1 receptor antagonist kinarate and anti-IL-1 beta biologics such as Ilaris that blocked the biological activities of IL-1 in inflammatory diseases. Let us give our full attention to Dr. Dina Reno, a pioneer in cytokine research. It's my honor to give this lecture as part of the Tang Foundation Prizes in Biopharmaceuticals. I'm honored to have received this prize, but now I'd like to give some background of the, of the interleukin-1 story and it's an important story. It's a story about how physicians dealt with fevers and infection. And it goes back over 5,000 years ago. At that time, and since then, there has been most investigations on fevers associated with infections. So typhus and malaria, for example. But in 1943, Physicians predicted that the body made its own endogenous fever-producing substance, and they called it endogenous pyrogen, which came from the Greek word for heat from pyrogen. Later, it was also called leukocytic pyrogen because it was discovered that this pyrogen came from white blood cells. The endogenous fever-producing substance would help physicians understand the fevers that they saw in their patients, but that fevers were not associated with infections. And that was the motivation to study this endogenous fever producing protein. Isolation and purification would be necessary to prove that this molecule, this endogenous fever producing molecule existed. And it would be important to study its structure. Its structure. How did it produce fever? In 1971, I started the purification of leukocytic pyrogen from human white blood cells. I was not the only person to attempt to purify this molecule. Others very interested in this concept were also attempting to purify this endogenous uh, fever producing substances uh, called endogenous pyrogen or leukocytic pyrogen. So that's in 1971. In 1974, while working on the purification of leukocytic pyrogen, we reported that there were two fever-producing molecules, 
two fever producing proteins. These are small proteins, molecular weights only about 15,000 Daltons, and they had two isotric focusing points. In time, these fever producing proteins would be called interleukin 1 beta and interleukin 1 alpha. As you can see from this slide, there are two isoelectric focusing points at pH 5 and pH 7. On the right side is fever, the fever that was produced by these proteins when they were separated by their isoelectric focusing points. The PI7 turned out to be called interleukin 1-beta, and the PI5 turned out to be called interleukin 1-alpha. In 1974, of course, we didn't know this. We only knew that there was more than one fever-producing molecule that had different physical characteristics. Purification was difficult because there are many proteins produced from human blood monocytes. As you can see from these two-dimensional gels, there are many proteins on the upper left-hand corner. And then we were able to make an antibody to interleukin-1 and help the purification considerably. And you can see from the last um, 2D gel on the right-hand side focusing uh, uh, and a focusing gradient, we had a single molecule. In 1977, we completed more than six years of research and reported in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that purified human leukocytic pyrogen had, would produce fever at 10 nanograms per kilogram. So the purified protein surprised many people because at that time, biological activity of proteins at 10 nanograms per kilogram was very rare and unheard of. But that was an important step in the history of cytokine biology, because that meant that proteins that had activity could be very potent at these very low concentrations. What happened next is people started to look at interleukin-1 as a pleiotrophic protein that had many biological activities. Of course, on the left-hand side was its effect on, on the hypothalamus and producing fever. And this later became the ability of interleukin-1 to stimulate cyclooxygenase-2. Its effect on neutrophils would later be that would later result in the discovery of the chemokines, particularly interleukin-8. In the liver, it was discovered that IL-1 induced IL-6, and interleukin-6 was the reason that acute phase proteins increased in many diseases. And then people looked at the effect of IL-1 on T cells and B cells, and this became an important aspect of the biology of cytokines, that it affected the immune system and cells of the immune system. Many of the stimulants of IL-1 would later be called toll-like receptors, and they would be recognized for their importance such in, in all the toll receptors, particularly uh, toll-2 and toll-4. From 1985 to 1990, the confirmation and expansion of multibiological activities were confirmed with recombinant IL-1s, as shown on this slide. What it really shows is the incredible multiple biological activities of a single protein. And other cytokines also were shown to have multiple biological activities. So during this time, Cytokine biology rapidly expanded with other cytokines and other biological activities. The recombinant IL-1 was injected into humans. And you can see from this slide, it produced fever at one to 10 nanograms per kilogram, exactly that had been predicted from the biological activity of the molecule <clears throat> from monocytes. In addition, to fever, that humans develop myalgias and joint pain, fatigue, neutrophilia, 
high levels of ACTH, GMCSF, GCSF, IL-6, and at higher doses, not really that high, but just higher than 10 nanograms a kilogram, hypotension developed and hemodynamic shock was observed in patients who received 300 nanograms a kilogram. But here's an important question. Why were people injecting such an inflammatory molecule into healthy humans or people with, with some diseases? And the reason was, at that time, cytokine biology was very exciting and people were, wanted to see what it did to the immune system, to other aspects of, of human physiology. But soon after these early experiments in humans, particularly in patients with cancer, the idea of injecting interleukin-1 and using interleukin-1 as a therapeutic was dropped. And the history of cytokines being used as, 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 a, as a treatment changed dramatically. And the focus was now on inhibiting cytokines such as IL-1, such as TNF, such as IL-6. And that's how cytokine biology changed early in, in the history of, of, of its effects on, on biological systems. So how does interleukin-1 induce inflammation? Very fundamental aspect of the inflammatory process is that IL-1 causes a very large number of pro-inflammatory secondary mediators. There are receptors for IL-1 called interleukin-1 receptor 1 on many cells, most cells, and a secondary or co-receptor called interleukin receptor 3. IL-1 alpha or beta will bind to the type 1 receptor first. And then this binding results, <clears throat> excuse me, in the um, dimerization with the receptor 3. And that dimerization results in the total like receptor areas in the cytoplasmic domains approximating each other. And that results in activation of the cytokine part of the molecule, the cytosolic part of the molecule, and the recruitment of other kinases such as MYD88. And the result is you have a very strong pro-inflammatory Sig signal. Here is what actually happens once the interleukin-1 receptor binds to the uh, uh, cytokine and you initiate the strong inflammatory signal. In the nucleus, we see genes that are not expressed in, in health, but genes that are expressed in disease. And these include cytokines and cytokine receptors, other cytokines such as uh, IL-6, for example. That's a good example of, of cytokines that are induced uh, by interleukin-1. Uh, release of the bone marrow leukocytes, that accounts for the high white blood cells that we see in patients. Chemokines in their receptors, such as interleukin-8. And in addition, adhesion molecules, which is very important for metastatic changes and also COX-2. COX-2 was discovered in interleukin-1-stimulated fibroblasts, and this accounts for prostaglandins, reduced pain threshold. And then also nitric oxide synthase, another gene, inducible nitric oxide, another gene that's associated with disease and not health. Phospholipase 2 is another aspect of this that leads to uh, uh, other secondary inflammatory mediators. Clinically, though, we observe <clears throat> systemic inflammation, local inflammation, decreased pain threshold, cell infiltration, and most important, tissue damage and remodeling. In most diseases, chronic inflammation results in tissue damage and remodeling, and that's how we measure the impact of disease uh, in, in, in people. Nature provided us with a natural blocker of IL-1 called the interleukin-1 receptor antagonist. 
This interleukin-1 receptor tactin is natural. It's part of the interleukin-1 family. It is a very strong binding to the type 1 receptor, as you can see here. But when interleukin-1 receptor binds to the type 1 receptor, dimerization does not take place. The tear domains do not approximate. There is no signal in the presence of IL-1. This we will discuss soon as a therapeutic triumph, actually, to treat disease with a natural occurring IL-1 receptor antagonist. Now, IL-1 alpha and beta shown on the slide are the two members of the IL-1 family that were worked on extensively beginning, I, I guess we could say 1974, when, when the two forms of IL-1 were, were, were discovered or reported. But most importantly, the IL-1 beta and IL-1 alpha are not isoforms, they're to separate genes, totally separate genes. Now, the IL-1 family now has 11 members, shown in the slide, IL-1 alpha, Beta and IL-33 are grouped, and those are called interleukin-1 subfamily. The IL-1 receptor antagonist belongs to the subfamily, but it's not pro-inflammatory. It's obviously anti-inflammatory. And as shown in the slide, green indicates anti-inflammatory properties, whereas red indicates pro-inflammatory cytokines. The IL-18 subfamily, contains two cytokines, IL-18, which is pro-inflammatory, and IL-37, which is anti-inflammatory. The next subfamily is the IL-36 subfamily, and IL-36 IL receptor antagonist is anti-inflammatory. IL-38 is anti-inflammatory, but IL-36 alpha, beta, and gamma is pro-inflammatory. And that completes the interleukin-1 family subdivided into, into subfamilies and containing a balance actually of pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory properties. It's as if nature made sure that the highly inflammatory members of the interleukin-1 family could be countered by other members which were anti-inflammatory. Now, blocking IL-1 from and family members, but I'm going to focus on IL-1 alpha and beta um, in, in diseases that range from gout, inflammatory gout arthritis, to something as complicated as cancer. I think that's perhaps the most exciting thing about the IL-1 story, is it doesn't limit itself to just inflammatory diseases. It also, it also considers other diseases, including the complexity of cancer. So now I'd like to talk about the clinical application of IO-1 blockade. What's available to study for the role of IO-1 in human diseases. The IO-1 receptor antagonist, the natural protein that we've discussed previously, <clears throat> blocks the IO-1 receptor, inhibits both interleukin-1 alpha and beta, but this has now been produced in recombinant forms, and recombinant interleukin-1 receptor antagonist now called anakinra. It's an approved drug, and it's produced by Swedish orphan biovitrum, or SOBI. Previously, it was produced by, by Amgen, but now Swedish biovitrum, or SOBI, is the main producer of anakinra. Anti-IL-1 beta-canakinumab, is also approved. It neutralizes IL-1 beta only. It has no effect on interleukin-1 alpha. It is produced by Novartis. Canakinumab has, approved, has been approved in several diseases. Um, and another antibody uh, in, to interleukin-1 beta by the Zoma company also neutralizes IL-1 beta, but this has not yet been approved. A soluble receptor called Relonicept has been approved. It's produced by Regeneron. It neutralizes IL-1 beta, IL-1 alpha, but has a slight effect on IL-1 receptor antagonists. This has been very useful, and recently it has been used to treat pericarditis, an inflammatory disease of the pericardium. And um, uh, the um, Relonicept has been very successful in treating pericarditis, um, and it is approved um, 
for use. And anti-I1-alpha, very interesting molecule that neutralizes interleukin-1-alpha, has no effect on I1-beta. It's been used in several studies, it is not yet approved, um, but it's big, big interest, a very large interest in antibodies to I1-alpha um, for use in skin diseases. But anti-I1-alpha is also be used in cancer, which we will discuss soon. Monoclonal antibody, um, uh, in, 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 for the antibody to I1-alpha has been used in many studies. Um, it's produced by X Biotech. Now the chronic inflammatory diseases that are responsive to blocking I1-beta include hereditary diseases with mutations resulting in loss of control of I1-beta secretions. These are very rare diseases and the mutations are very unique. There are chronic inflammatory diseases that respond to IL-1 blockade, but there's no known genetic explanation. No mutations have been found. Some people speculate there are somatic mutations that account for some of the chronic diseases that are um, responsive to IL-1 blockade, but we have no specific genetic um, explanation. But most important are the common acute and chronic inflammatory diseases. And here is where we really understand and appreciate the importance of blocking IL-1. Top of the list are refractory gout attacks. These are exquisitely controlled by blocking IL-1, whether with canakinumab or with um, anakinra, and recently with the NLRP3 inhibitor, which we'll discuss later. Also, is myocardial infarction remodeling that results in heart failure? This is also responsive to, to um, Anakinra. And many papers, particularly from Antonio Abate's uh, a, a group, has shown that uh, post-myocardial infarction remodeling results in heart failure is IL-1 responsive with Anakinra. Also, decompensated heart failure is also responsible, uh, responsive to Anakinra. Glycemic control and type two diabetes, we'll discuss this in a second. This is a very important aspect of the biology of IL-1. There's also insulin resistance in type one diabetes, which is also responsive to anakinra. And very interesting is dry eye disease. Dry eye disease is actually quite common and anakinra drops into the eye is actually very effective. But the most interesting and the most Unexpected one is autoimmune hearing loss. Hearing loss actually is associated with cognitive dysfunctions. And here we have inflammation in the cochlea that results in, in hearing loss. And last, but most importantly, is the role of IL-1 in cancer, which we'll discuss in some detail so soon. Now I'll go back to interleukin-1 receptor antagonists and type two diabetes. Type two diabetes has become epidemic in some countries, and it accounts for a tremendous amount of disease cost and cardiovascular disease. Yet this is an, an IL-1 disease in the sense that you can use IL-1 receptor antagonists to prevent the glycemic um, uh, abnormalities of type two diabetes. If you look at the levels of IL-1 beta messenger RNA in the beta cells of patients with type two diabetes, you can see IL-1 beta is very high and the beta cells from non-diabetic patients um, do not have a constitutive IL-1 beta. So in type two diabetes, the beta cell which makes insulin also makes IL-1 beta. And here is the trial. This is the effect of of comparison of placebo with anakinra um, for um, type two diabetes C-reactive protein levels. It's on the left and interleukin six levels on the right. As you can see, compared to placebo, it was very dramatic reductions at four weeks and 13 weeks. The trial was 13 weeks. And during that time, we have glycemic control with A1C decreasing and markers of inflammation decreasing. 
Now, from this concept that IL-1 beta was an agonist for type 2 diabetes, came the problem of type 2 diabetes and atherosclerosis. And the cardiovascular events associated with cardio with atherosclerosis include stroke and myocardial infarction. And the concept that this was driven by I1 beta starts with the type 2 diabetes trial with Anna Kinra that we just reviewed. Now, Kinemab targets specifically I1 beta, it's neutralizing monoclonal antibody. And the concept was started that if you could block IL-1 beta, you would reduce the risk of a heart attack or a cardiovascular event such as a stroke. And so the trial was designed um, by Peter Libby and Paul Ritka, together with colleagues from, from Novartis, in a very large aggressive study, worldwide study, um, of over 10,000 subjects. The original trial was actually 17,000 subjects. And these were patients at high risk for a cardiovascular event having had a previous heart attack or stroke. And the, they were selected based upon an elevated CRP that was not responsive to standard therapies such as statins. And the trial was called CANTOS. And it was a milestone in cytokine biology. This is the paper title from the New England Journal of Medicine, Anti-Inflammatory anti Therapy with Canakinumab for Atherosclerotic Diseases. And it was treatment for four years. You can see the treatment was administration, a parental administration, of four doses each year over the course of four years. As you can see, the C-reactive protein, which is a measure of, of inflammation, particularly in the heart, plummets very fast uh, within three months um, and continue to be suppressed for the entire uh, trial. And the doses of this randomized placebo-controlled trial was 50, 150, and 300 milligrams of kinekinumab uh, four times a year compared to placebo four times a year. And the trial met its primary goals. And here's an example of, of the primary endpoint, the incidence of myocardial infarctions. Um, for all doses, highly statistically significant, uh, secondary endpoints, and the incidence of myocardial infarction, stroke, or death from any cause. And the next slide shows that the infarction rate was down, the hospitalization for unstable angina that led that would lead to um, revascularization with stenting was significantly reduced in any revascularization. So by all criteria, kinekinumab, monotherapy, and these patients significantly met its primary and secondary endpoints, reduced the consequences of atherosclerotic coronary artery disease. Now, I have to go a little bit um, uh, from the main uh, topic of, the, of, of, of today, which is inflammatory diseases, and talk just briefly about uh, new trials and data uh, on, on, on blocking IL-1 in COVID-19. This is the, one of our papers from my um, former postdoc, Gilles Kaplansky from France. And you can see this is early treatment with IL-1 receptor antagonist, uh, Anakinra, uh, uh, for severe inflammatory respiratory failure. And it's early treatment was this trial. You can see on the left, the, it's a small trial, Anakinra, um, we were only 12 patients and, and, and selected controls, but it was the first time that we appreciated that very early treatment, not requiring high doses of anakinra, were, were effective in reducing uh, not only death, but the days in the ICU and, and on a respirator. There are other important trials that, that 
I don't have time to discuss, but that that, that all also reported many of them reported one or two cases of anakinra being very effective, but these were not controlled trials. But the basis for all of this uh, blocking IL-1 uh, in, in COVID-19 is based upon the activation of the NLRP3 inflammasome, which you can see very early on in COVID-19 patients. And on the left is subject one, which does not have um, COVID-19. There's no NLRP3 expression. And then two subjects with, with the disease. And you can see NLRP3 in the circulating monocytes uh, by Western blotting. And panel C and panel D is a relationship between IO and beta uh, gene expression and NLRP3 uh, in, these, in these two patients. Uh, excuse me, in several patients. On this slide, we show the data of an Anna Kinder trial, a double blind randomized control trial in patients with COVID-19. The uniqueness of this trial was the use of plasma levels of soluble urokinase plasminogen receptor levels to select the patients who would be treated with anakinra. <clears throat> As shown on, this, on the slide on the left lower corner, are the patients treated with anakinra um, that had reduced um, respiratory failure compared to the placebo. On the right side of the screen is depicted the various parameters that were measured in this trial. Please look at the bottom in red, and you can see that the number of patients who died were lower in the Anakinra group compared to the placebo group. Also indicated in, in, in green are, are the symptoms that, that, that were recorded. And at the top, you can see that the patients um, who fully recovered were, were greater in the anakinra group compared to the placebo group. So this is a very important trial to use a predictive plasma level of soluble urokinase plasminogen activator inhibitor. Now, I want to end with blocking IL-1 beta in cancer. We'll also discuss IL-1-alpha. This is perhaps the new frontier for IL-1. The important paper came from the canakinumab study, Cantos for atherosclerosis. Although not designed as a cancer trial, the data were very compelling. And the data revealed that when you treat a patient for another disease, such as atherosclerosis, um, you can observe a secondary effect on another parameter, another disease. In this particular case, the patients were selected that did not have cancer. The Cantos trial of over 10,000 patients, they did not have cancer. They were screened that they did not have cancer, but clearly they had occult cancer or developed cancer during the trial. Many of these patients were smokers. That's why they had atherosclerosis. And these are the patients that actually had a higher risk of developing cancer. The, the great surprise was it was highly effective. And I wanna show you how effective this was. This is the Cantos trial data with placebo and the three doses of canakinumab. And you can see a 51 reduction in death from any cancer. Now important in any of these trials, um, that are um, for another disease. And then in the course of the trial, a patient develops another disease, in that particular case, cancer. The therapies usually stop. So in canakinumab trial for atherosclerosis, when the patients were discovered to have lung cancer, they were dropped from the trial. They received no more canakinumab. They were out of the trial and they went to an oncologist to be treated for their cancer. So the death rate from any cancer, highly significant, dose dependent, you can see. 
were patients that had stopped canakinumab and then went to an oncologist to be treated. So this was not, in most cases, continuous use of canakinumab. It was just maybe one year, two years, three years of canakinumab treatment before the cancer was discovered. So that's quite a remarkable observation. If you look specifically now as the incidence of lung cancer, you see a 67% reduction in the incidence of lung cancer. Again, the patients were enrolled for atherosclerosis and heart disease, and they did not have any evidence of cancer. They obviously received x-rays um, as part of their entry criteria into the trial. And then the big surprise is death. 77% 77 reduction, 77 reduction in fatal lung cancer uh, in patients who receive 300 milligrams four times a year. Again, once the cancer, lung cancer was discovered, canakinumab was stopped and the patients were treated with traditional therapy, whether it would be resection or chemotherapy or radiation therapy. Quite a remarkable finding, unexpected finding um, for the role of IL-1 beta in cancer. Now, I want to go on to what happens with IL-1 beta um, in another type of, 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 of cancer, which is melanoma. And here we examined um, the role of NLRP3, uh, the nucleotide uh, uh, sensor. Um, and here you see the correlation of I1 beta uh, and NLRP3 expression in, in one of the cancer databases. On the right-hand side is actually the demonstration of melanoma cells expressing um, in three patients, patients one, two, and three examples, um, in patients with the tumor themselves expressing NLRP3. So NLRP3 expression in patients with melanoma is, is a fact. And the number of patients who do have NLRP3 uh, expression in the melanoma itself is quite high. In this trial, in mice, it's a mouse style study now, the previous study was, was human data. We know that you can block with um, oral monotherapy to an, NL, an NLRP3 inhibitor called OLT1177. And you can see that this has reduced <clears throat> survival uh, in mice. Also in this trial in mice with melanoma, you can see that <clears throat> cytokines were reduced with 1177 circulating IL-6, circulating GCSF, IL-1 beta. And you can also see this um, in, in the tumor itself. Uh, 1177 treatment reduces IL-1 beta and IL-6 in the tumor itself. Now, the mechanism for this is actually IL-1 beta-driven myeloid-derived suppressor cells. Myeloid-derived suppressor cells suppress the natural immune system's attack on tumors. So it's, it's a, it's a pro-tumor um, mechanism. Myeloid-derived suppressor cells, whether they're from uh, origins of, of polymorphic nuclear leukocytes or monocytes, and 1177 re reverses that and reduces that. So this is an effect of NLRP3 inhibition to reduce the immunosuppression that occurs in cancer. This actually relates to checkpoint inhibitors. And as shown in the next slide, we actually, in this study, in this paper, added 1177, the NLRP3 inhibitor, to mice that were being treated with anti-PD1, anti -PD the classic checkpoint inhibitor used in patients. And as you can see from the left-hand side, 1177 was administered at, at, on day four and continued for, for the duration of, of, the, of the model. And then anti-PDD was added. And on the right-hand side, you can see that the combination, uh, which is shown in magenta, uh, is quite a reduction in the tumor volume of the melanoma in these mice. Uh, 
And this is the basis for actually combining an NLRP3 inhibitor with a checkpoint inhibitor in clinical cancers. And those studies are being planned now. And I wanna end now with the story of IL-1 alpha. We don't pay that much attention to IL-1 alpha because it's mostly associated with skin diseases, but IL-1 alpha is also associated with colorectal cancer. Um, and, and, and it's a very important aspect that, that, that IL-1 alpha is constituently expressed in the epithelial cells of the gastrointestinal tract. And what happens in cancer is these colonic epithelial cells that become malignant cells are big producers of IL-1 alpha. And the question was, what if you inhibit IL-1 alpha in colorectal cancer with an antibody that specifically neutralizes IL-1 alpha? And the study was actually a double-blind placebo-controlled trial of an antibody to IL-1 alpha in advanced colorectal cancer. In the end point, and these patients were quite sick with metastatic disease, the endpoint was a composite sort of increased lean body mass by DEXA scan and decreased pain, fatigue, and anorexia. This is palliative therapy, but it points out that IL-1 alpha is very functional in terms of inflammation and bringing about pain, fatigue, and anorexia. The secondary endpoints were objective, systemic inflammation by measuring IL-6 levels and, and platelet count and the quality of life changes, and all meant primary and secondary endpoints. This is the schedule of treatment of anti-IL-1 alpha or placebo, and the outcome assessed at eight weeks and later. And here is the most impressive data. The ones that reached endpoints um, were obviously survivors. You can see the difference between 11 months survival compared to four months. Those that met the end point with anti-IL-1 alpha had a greater survival. Now, the message from this is obviously to start anti-IL-1 alpha much earlier in colorectal cancer. But at this point, the, these data from a placebo-controlled randomized trial tell us that there's a real role for IL-1 alpha in this colorectal cancer uh, population. I would like to conclude this lecture with three important observations that are relevant and are the product of over 40 years of research on interleukin-1 and its family. Blocking IL-1, either IL-1-alpha or IL-1-beta with antikinra, the soluble receptor relonicept, a neutralizing antibody, canakinumab to IL-1-beta, or a neutralizing antibody to IL-1-alpha, is effective in rare as well as common inflammatory diseases, including COVID-19. We also conclude that blocking IL-1, either IL-1-alpha or beta in cancer, is a new frontier in biology, and several trials are underway. And finally, we conclude that although parenteral therapy with anti IL-1 beta is effective in inflammatory diseases, as, as well as in patients with cancer, orally active and safe specific inhibitors of the NLRP3 inflammasome can be as effective as parenteral therapy with IL-1 beta. Having an orally effective and safe pill to treat IL-1 beta-mediated diseases is truly an advance that many of us had never appreciated. Thank you very much for your attention to this lecture. Thank you, Dr. Dinarello, for such an inspiring speech and for your remarkable efforts to create a better world through science. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the 2020 Tang Prize Laureate Lecture in Biopharmaceutical Science. Thank you all for joining us today. Please stay tuned for the announcement of the 2022 Tang Prize Laureate in Biopharmaceutical Science.